good morning, good morning to each and every one of us. Glad we're here this morning. We had a long week and a safe week. Of course we did. And we should be plenty rested, because I am. <laughs> Let's go into our work and prayer. Can we stand, please, and bow our heads? Dear my gracious Father, I thank you for this week, Father God. I thank you. Father God, keep continuing to watch it over this church. Father God, we might be small in numbers, but it's okay. We can still praise your name. And I thank you, Father. Thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going into our praise and worship with our kids. Behind me, the cross before me. 
now we're going to the praise of worship with the elders.
we're going into our catch up five minutes with who we are with Alicia Brady. Catch up five ministries who we are. The Apostle Paul stated that the work of the Christian church is to build up the body of Christ so that all may become mature Christians. Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. Catch up five ministries is committed to fulfilling this scripture. Our mission is to draw people to Christ and enable them to continually grow into being like Christ. Catch a Fire Ministries is composed of disciples and led by disciples. Catch a Fire Ministries is an affiliate of Church of God, a prophecy, Buckley, Buckley St. Kitts. This church falls under the leadership of Bishop Lionel Philip Webb. Worship time, Sundays 9.30, Sunday morning worship, Wednesdays 5.30, discipleship class, fellowship, Saturdays 11 a.m., praise and worship team practice. I would like to welcome all the visitors here today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. It's offering time. And Alicia. For those who can give, thank you for those who cannot give. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Ways to give online, catch up five ministries.org, Zell C O F M 1013 at protimemail.com. Offering scripture, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 7. Remember this: whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father and our God, we lift up holy hands and we worship you. We thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning, to let everyone know that we know our risen Savior whose name is Jesus. And right now, in the name of Jesus, we take authority over everything that's not of you. In the name of Jesus, we cancel all the plans of the enemy. And we declare and decree that we've been made more than conquerors. We are victorious to the blood of Jesus Christ. We declare and decree that your presence is here this morning. That chains are being broken. Oh, we thank you, Lord, because you're setting us free from all the plans of the enemy. Oh, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We can't say thank you enough. Oh, Jesus. Let your presence continue to be with us all through the service in your name, Jesus. We're going to try scripture reading with Miss Alicia. Scripture reading Luke 19, 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was so short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and saw him. Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Now we're coming to the sermon and the Dexter song.
scripture was read very beautifully by Miss Alicia. Our title today is Today Salvation Has Come, read from the book of Luke, chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. Let's pray. Heavenly Father and our God, we ask your blessing and your protection on all of us here today. We ask that you'll open the eyes of our hearts so that we may truly see you. We ask for a change and a difference. Right now, in the name of Jesus, we cancel every spirit that's not of you. We bring everything in subjection to your word, God. And in the name of Jesus, we declare and decree that chains will be broken. In the name of Jesus, we declare and decree that the world will go forth with power. In the name of Jesus, we declare and decree that change will become forth in all of our lives as we commit ourselves to truly serving you. Uh, we're going to serve you much better than ever before in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. We're in the book of Luke. The apostle Luke, as we have said many times before, was a physician, a doctor, and a companion of the apostle Paul. Luke wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts. And these are number one and number three in length in the New Testament, which means that Luke wrote most of the New Testament, more than the Apostle Paul, more than the Apostle John. And he was very detailed. He wrote a lot about women, the outcast, the poor, how Jesus reached out to them. Because Jesus, Christianity is not a religion just for the exclusive few or for the rich only. Jesus, in fact, this is one thing that said about Christianity, that this is a religion that anybody could become a part of in Jesus' name. And that's what it's about. And Luke, as a doctor, coming to the end of his life, he was writing because at that time, there were still people who had walked with Jesus. But they were dying out. And he wanted to document what had been done. In addition, the Roman emperor was becoming very hostile to Christianity. And so he wanted to show that Christianity and the Roman em em empire were compatible. It is only in the Gospel of Luke that we find that emperors are named. And we are here in chapter 19, and Jesus is coming to the end of his time here on earth. For three years, he's been walking. He didn't come and get a chariot and horses. He walked among the poor. They say if you calculated how much Jesus walked in those three years, he would have walked around the earth like three times. He kept moving. He didn't just sit down and stay one place. You know, there are some denominations that will switch out the pastors. And sometimes I wonder if that's not the best. Because sometimes if you stay in one spot too long, you tend to get caught up in things that maybe might not be of God. And so Jesus kept moving, kept working with his disciples. He had 12 disciples. One betrayed him. People are going to betray us. This man was in the presence of Jesus, the Son of God, and he still turned on him and, 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 and put him out for money. Judas. It doesn't matter. We keep on doing God's will. And so it says that Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. Now in the Old Testament, we hear about Joshua um, bringing down the walls of Jericho. That's not that Jericho. That Jericho was just was a village close by. But this was a new Jericho that had been built up by Herod the Great. And his son Achilles continued the work. This Jericho was extremely wealthy, extremely prosperous. It was on the great caravan, caravan, caravan route between Damascus and Arabia. It had what he referred to as groves, groves of balsam. 
Balsam was a tree that produced a balm, a healing balm. We still talk about it when we sing that song, Is There No Balm in Gilead? Because this balm is able to heal you, able to help you feel better, and it also had uh, palm trees. It had roses because it had springs that would run, and the Romans built an aqueduct, like a, a tunnel, to bring water from these springs for the fertile soil. And they said that it smelled so beautifully, Jericho, you felt like it was perfume in the air because of these balsam trees. And it was so rich. We have heard of Cleopatra and Mark Antony. Mark Antony gave the rights to these groves. He gave them to Cleopatra. You know how much he was in love with Cleopatra. So he gave her a lot of money. He just said, have that. And you know what she did? She sold it to Herod. <laughs> she got rid of it and collected the money. <laughs> you could read about this. People like to say that the Bible is a book of myths. History certifies what is written here. And so we find Josephus saying that this was the most rich area in all of Palestine. They call it the Eden of Palestine. You know, and it was so prosperous that the Romans were able to collect a lot of money from this area. There were three great taxation cities in all of Palestine, Caesarea, Capernaum, and Jericho. It's like saying uh, there's New York, there's L.A., and what's another one that's really rich? Uh, I didn't hear. Las Vegas. Las Vegas. Money is running through those cities. So this is, Jericho is one of those cities that there's a lot of money. Not only that, it was a Levitical city. When God brought Israel into the promised land, he told the priests, you're not going to work. And he told them to set aside cities where they could worship. Jer Jericho is only 15 miles from Jerusalem. And at that time, Herod's temple had over 20,000 priests. Can you imagine how big this temple was that Herod spent years building? And so all of them weren't needed at the same time. So most of them, a lot of them lived in Jericho because it was only 15 miles, one day journey to get to Jerusalem. And Jericho was also the last stop. If you're going into Jerusalem for the Passover, from Galilee or Perea, you had to pass to Jericho because the road to Jerusalem ran to Jericho. So this is where the pilgrims would spend the night, their last stop, as they're making their way up to Jerusalem for the Passover for a great feast. And so Jesus is passing to Jericho. He's passing to Jericho, and he will never pass back. Other people are going to pass back. But Jesus is going up to Jerusalem to die, to fulfill his destiny. He came to die for the sin of the world. If he hadn't died, we would not be here today. So this is... As my grandma said, he's dancing his last cast. He's surrounded by a crowd. And he's passing through. And as he's passing through, he's doing great work. Because the Bible tells us that he had just healed ba blind Bartimaeus, who was at the corner, at the wayside, begging for money. The Bible also tells us that the rich young ruler ran up to him and said, Lord, how can I have eternal life? And he said to him, sell all you have and give to the poor. And he, the Bible said he was very wealthy and he wasn't prepared to do that. So he told Jesus, okay, later, can't do that. And the scripture said that Jesus said to them, it's very hard for rich people to enter the kingdom of heaven. All throughout history you'll find that it's easier for us to believe in Jesus who don't come. We have not inherited trust funds. 
you know, most of us, what we get from our, our family is diabetes and blood pressure. <laughs> That's our inheritance. We don't have millions of dollars that they put up for us, you know. I, I remember now, yeah, I understand what my grandmother probably died and didn't know. She said, my grandmother's husband died when she had uh, six children and the oldest was nine. And she said, and she was pregnant with the sixth one when he died. And she said he went to see the doctor. And the doctor said to him that he gonna be better in nine days. And nine days later, he was dead. And my brother went into a coma and nine days later, he also was dead. I didn't know until it happened to me that I, with, there's diabetes running in the family because I lost, I just couldn't see. And I went to the doctor and the doctor says, something is going on with your blood sugar. Otherwise you wouldn't just lose your sight like that. Go to the urgent care. And when I went to the urgent care, the woman said to me, you know, your blood sugar is over 800. Your organs have to be shutting down. Just go to the emergency room and, you know, expect that they're going to have to keep you because you have to be dying. My A1C, they said that the, it didn't go past 18 and it, the needle was trying to get past 18. And I didn't know. But I'm going to tell you that the God we serve. As I was going to the hospital, I declared and decree that the death she had spoken over me would not come to pass. And they tested me there and they agreed. They came up with 700 and something. And y'all know you shouldn't be more than 120. But as they tested, it came back perfect. Kidney fine, liver fine, everything fine. In fact, they got mad and said, we, not, we don't treat diabetes here. Go and see a doctor. This is the emergency room. And nothing is wrong with you. That's what the Lord can do. Otherwise, my destiny would have been to follow like my brother, like my grandfather, and just die of this diabetes that I didn't know I had and was prepared to take me out. But for the Lord, had it not been for the Lord... You know, so this is what we're talking about, that this, we're not accustomed to money, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because God don't care about that. And God's Jesus was passing through. He, Zacchaeus and him came into, into contact. And Jesus is still passing through. He's not in physical form anymore. But he said, my spirit is going to be with you. He said, I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. We have had so many people get up and leave. So many people who say, oh, I'm going to be with you. you. I got your back. And we can't find them when it really goes down. But Jesus is with us right now. He's passing through. And he says, I hear your tears. I hear the hurt of the years. And I've come to make a difference. I've come to do the work. I'm the only person. I'm the only person. I'm the only spirit. I'm the only God who can really make a change in your life. And that's what we're talking about today. An encounter with Jesus. You know, and a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. Interestingly, the Bible says, all the scholars said that the name Zacchaeus means pure. You know, based on how the people were going on about him, he wasn't doing anything pure. He looked like he was very evil. But as parents, I'm sure that when they gave him that name, his parents expected that he would live up to it. You know, and as parents, we too have to do the same. We can't look at what's happening and help other people speak death over our children. We got to, in the name of Jesus, say, they're not always going to be in trouble. In the name of Jesus, they're coming out. In the name of Jesus, they're finding favor with their teachers. And they're going to prosper and do well. They're not always going to be in trouble. 
in the name of Jesus to speak over our lives as well. Oh, it don't matter what weapon is formed against us. It will not prosper in the name of Jesus. Angels are all around our house, all around our families, and they're bringing us out in the name of Jesus. Oh, we know that we've been made more than conquerors. So we speak life because life and death is in the tongue. And I declare and decree that where we are today is not where we're always going to be. In the name of Jesus, our debts will be paid. We will own our home. We will not have any more financial difficulties. In the name of Jesus, God is working it out on our behalf. In the name of Jesus. And the scriptures say he was a chief tax collector and he was wealthy. Six times Luke talks about tax collectors. This is the final time that he's going to talk about tax collectors. And it is only here in the book of Luke that these words that say chief tax collector appear in the New Testament. This means that Zacchaeus wasn't an ordinary tax collector. Junior tax collectors reported to him. And as the chief tax collector, he was in charge over all of New York. He was the equivalent of New York. How much he was, how important and prosperous this place was. Zacchaeus was in charge. He was at the top of the food train. And the Jews hated him. You know, he had money. He was important in the Roman Empire. But the Jews hated him. Why? They didn't want to be on the Roman rule. And the Romans made them pay taxes. And the way they paid taxes was particularly wicked. It was like they would say, I, uh, I'm looking at tax collector for Clarksville. Who wants to be the tax collector for Clarksville? And it might be... Devante might be London, it might be uh, Jamari, one come and say, yeah, I'll do it, I'll do it. And they'd say, okay, how much you could get me? So if London and the other London only said 10, 10 million a year, and Devante said eight, but Jamari said 15 million, they say, okay, Jamari, you got the job. They didn't care how he came up with the 15 million. And Jamari would make sure he collect like 30 because they didn't care how much he collected as long as he got, they got the 15. So they were very wicked. And so they said that these, that these tax collectors, according to the Jews, they considered them to be thieves and murderers because they were killing people. I never forget my grandmother said that if you look at rum shot owners, she said they always die badly. Because she said they are trafficking in the children's food, in the rent. Because the, the men come and they don't care about supporting their children or paying their bills. They just want the rum. So this was exactly how these tax collectors were doing. They were just collecting the money. They don't care if afterwards you can't eat or feed your children or do anything. That's long as they got the money. And the Roman soldiers would help them. You had to pay it. Because they had the soldiers' support to get that money out of you. And so you find that in the Jewish society there were four things, four sets of people that they said were the worst. There was the tanners who made nice leather bags and leather coats because they were dealing with dead animals and, dead ta and, 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 and hides from these animals and they smelled bad. Then there were the donkey drivers because donkeys were considered ceremonially unclean. So if you were driving a donkey, then you too were unclean. And then there were the people they had public bathrooms and public uh, restrooms, the people who cleaned this, they were also unclean. So these were the four people, tax collectors, bathroom attendants, 
tanners and donkey drivers who were at the bottom of the barrel in Jewish society. A tax collector could not go in court and be a witness or be a judge. There were, as women couldn't be a witness either. So they were really putting them down. They couldn't go there. And they considered them to be morally deficient. They were like they were in the mafia. And so if they were mafia, and you know that, you have to play, pay protection money. And so Zacchaeus was like the don of the mafia. He was at the very top. He was running all of the illegal, all of the illegal activities. He was a chief. And we have just met a rich young man who couldn't make it to see Jesus. And here Luke is mentioning another rich person. But the outcome is different here. Because Jesus didn't say it's impossible for the rich. He said it's difficult. But with God, all things are possible. And so we see there really is nothing wrong with money. The scripture is very clear. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil. Any evil you find, trafficking, selling people into slavery, is because big money was in it. Slavery didn't stop until it was no longer profitable. When Abraham Lincoln sent out his armies and they burnt the South flat, that's how slavery got to end. When England ended slavery, it was because William Wilberforce, the, U, the British Navy used to protect the slave ships. And he got the law passed that they would no longer protect the slave ships. And so pirates started robbing the ships. And so they gave up on the business of selling slaves because they were no longer making money. People don't stop doing evil out of the goodness of their heart. The love of money is the root of all evil. But there is nothing wrong with having money. The Bible says that money answereth all things. And in Peter... He told, Paul told Timothy that if you're rich, you need to be generous and sheer. We need, it can't just be all the evil people have money. God's people need money to, to do God's will. And we look back in history and the count who financed the Moravian church. And the Moravian church came to the Caribbean. They taught slaves to read. The churches are still there. They changed the course of history in our islands because this man gave them the money to go. And he had the money and he decided to use it for Jesus. So it's my prayer that not just me, that all of us, We'll have money, but we will do right. Do what God wants us to do. If you really love God, you ain't nothing to just, I got a new car, I got a hundred cars. I keep telling people, LeBron James is in his 20th second year of playing basketball. And he's still in the top five. That has never happened in the history of the NBA. But you know what LeBron does? He started a school right there where he's from in Akron, Ohio, one of the worst places. And he gave them everything. And then he said, he said that it's not enough to take them to school and give them a good meal and uniforms. Because he said when they leave school, their parents are homeless. And so they can't study still. So he started building homes for them. You want to tell me the Bible says that when you give to the poor, you lend to God. And God don't owe nobody. He could have just kept on giving money to himself like a lot of people do. But that's what it's about. That we're supposed to help. That some of us don't plan to. So God can't trust us with money. But if God sees that we'll do with the money what he wants us to do, he'll be able to trust us with it. And I pray that we'll get there. And Zacchaeus had a problem. He was short. We always talk about short men. Because it seemed like they have Hitler was short. Napoleon was short. Vladimir Putin in Russia is short. All throughout history, the most wicked men you could find is short men. 
And it seemed like they have to make up for the fact that they're short. And Vladimir was at the top of the food chain when it come to evil. Not Vladimir, Zacchaeus. He was short. And he couldn't see over the crowd. And you know, like how they didn't like him, he wasn't getting through that crowd. Nobody was saying, oh, let Zacchaeus pass because he's short. And he wanted to see. Everybody's like, leave that wicked one out there. You know, he wanted to see who Jesus was. Uh, that he didn't say he wanted to see Jesus. Like, look on his face. Oh, that's how he look? Oh, I didn't know he was so tall. I didn't know he was so fair. He said he wanted to see who Jesus was. That means he wanted a deeper look at Jesus. He wanted to know what kind of man this Jesus was that he had heard so much about. Just recently, Jesus had healed Bartimaeus. Jesus had been for three years healing the sick, raising the dead. And here was Jesus passing in front of him. Let me tell you, the first time I got a radio as a child, I, somebody gave me this radio, brought it my coach. I used to pretend to be an athlete and try and run track. And I guess he realized he brought me a radio with a cassette player. And the very first cassette that played music that I ever had was Shirley Caesar and her album, Jesus. I was about 14 then. And I remember I played, you young people understand, I played that song until the tape just gave up. I re rewind it. I did everything I could. And I remember my saying that I can't sing, but the only thing I know how to do is speak. And I hope that one of these days I could speak like how she's singing with all of my heart. I was telling Latoy this morning that I couldn't get, my children didn't like to get up. But Sunday morning, but they didn't like to hear Shirley sees either. So I would put it on top volume, which would get them out of the bed and running to turn it down. And they will tell you that until they were about eight, they didn't know there was any other kind of music except gospel music, and that Shirley Caesar was the only singer. <laughs> Because she had touched my life. And this is what Zacchaeus is doing here. And the point of the story is that when I was in New York studying, 1987, Shirley Caesar came to the Apollo Theater. And I used to make $30 an hour. And the cheapest ticket was 25 And I took all the money I had that week. I didn't eat lunch because I wanted to see her. I remember being so far up, I couldn't even see her properly. But I'll never forget that she had on some kind of diamond ring. Because when the light hit it, <laughs> the light went way up there. I've never forgotten that. And when she came on stage, it was worth it. Everybody started screaming when Shirley Caesar took the mic. Because she was still praising God like how she was praising when she, she got it. The point of the story is Zacchaeus was looking, like how I was looking to see Shirley Caesar for real, to see the, ma the woman who had touched my life. Zacchaeus was looking for this Jesus who had made such a change in so many people. The scripture says he went about doing good. He didn't just stay there and say, look at me, I'm the son of God, I'm about to die for the sin of the world. I'm the important one there. He went about doing good. And Zacchaeus just couldn't see. He was short. Uh, but the scripture says that he wanted to see Jesus. One of the most touched, I don't know who did this, but I really like to see it. I want to, I want to see you. Open my eyes to, to, to your heart, to my heart, Lord. Because wonderful. You know, because this is what all of our motto should be. I want to see Jesus. I want us to see Jesus. 
If we really see Jesus, I can't begin to tell you what it will mean to all of us. It is my prayer that we will see Jesus. Sometimes you just got to keep us children in church so we may come to know who Jesus is. And so Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus. And they say, the crowd wouldn't let him through. Jesus was coming. And so he said, he's going to run down in front of the crowd and climb up in a tree. You know, when you want to see a parade, you go early and you make sure you get a good spot so that you could see the parade when it's passing by. So I'm sure Zacchaeus didn't know what was going to happen. He just wanted to put his eyes on this man, Jesus. And he didn't say, I'm so rich. I can't be seen running. I'm too cute to run. You know, servants should be helping me. And the sycamore tree that they talk about, they say 2015 they discovered that it was not a native tree in Palestine. It was brought there by the Philistines. So hundreds of years before, God had put everything in place so that Zacchaeus would have a tree to climb up in. The branches were low, and so he could just grab on in his short self and get up into the tree. So this is Zacchaeus, not saying, I'm too good looking, I'm too rich. People might laugh at me. People going to laugh at you. People, no matter how good you are, people going to laugh. You got to make up your mind that you don't care what people have to say. I keep saying that Elon Musk is the richest man in the world, and people are always talking bad about him. And you think he care? He said, you cannot get anywhere in life caring about other people's opinion. If you care about other people's opinion, they control you. Because you're going to do what they tell you to do and behave how they want you to behave. I only care about what Jesus says. We only supposed to care about what Jesus says. When I hear people say things about me, I said, I'm not that person in the name of Jesus. I am only who Jesus says I am. I am God's precious workmanship. You know, if I were to listen to people, I wouldn't make it in this life. Ah, people like to remind you about things that you did wrong. But we cancel that in the name of Jesus because it's in the past. And the Bible says, as far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed your transgression. That means we can never run into it again. I don't care who have a memory of what we did wrong or what where we went. In the name of Jesus, we are new creatures. Creatures, we're brand new men in the name of Jesus. And Zacchaeus wasn't interested in anything. Like the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul says, I consider everything to be garbage when it comes to knowing Jesus. The Apostle Paul was well educated, well off. He was a Roman citizen. And he went through hardship, prison, shipwreck, beatings. And he said he didn't care. Because what that meant is at the end of it, he knew Jesus. The scripture says, Job says, when he has tried me, I'm going to come forth as pure gold. You can't get good at anything without testing. With, you cannot be an athlete unless you get up and run and train and do stuff. You got to go through things if you're going to live for Jesus. That's what it's about. And when Jesus came to where Zacchaeus was, he said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I'm going to stay at your house today. Jeremiah said that if you seek me with all your heart, you will be found of me. I know a lot of times we've tried to prove to people we love them and they couldn't care less. They take our love and toss it aside and treat us badly. But that's not going to happen with Jesus. 
He says, seek me and I will be found of you. And so he came to the tree where Zacchaeus had embarrassed himself and climbed up in a tree. And he said, Zacchaeus, come down. Ah, today I'm going to be at your house immediately. When God calls us by name, it's a call to live for him. When he called Peter, Matthew, James, and John, they left everything to become his disciples. Tasha Cap says he knows my name. He knows our name. And he's calling it right now to say, I want to know you. I want you to be my disciple. And he said, today I must. The Greek word must that he is using, it was only used when he said, I must come, I must die, and I must rise again. He used it when he went to see the woman at Samaria. He was telling Zacchaeus, I left the splendor of heaven for this moment to call you out of this tree. I plan to meet with you because you have a heart for me. I don't despise you. The rest of the world might despise you, but I love you. I care for you, and I want to do greater work in your life. Jesus was saying, I'm not here by chance. And I want to tell you that Paul says now is the day of salvation. Ah, we don't have yesterday. Time travel is a myth that will never come true. We'll never be able to go back in time. Tomorrow is not promise. Ask me. I found that out when my brother died at 29. I wasn't even in the country, I was in England. I never got to say goodbye, even if I was there. He went into a coma and never came out. Ah, tomorrow is not promise. It doesn't matter how young you are. I'm sure we all know people have passed on from earth, from time to eternity. And today is the time. Today, now is the time to give God the best of our lives and the best of our years. God wants to do a great work. You all, we are all talented and gifted by God. And God wants to use what we have for his glory and for his kingdom. And Zacchaeus came down at once. He didn't stay up there saying, oh, I'm important. Let me take my time. He came down at once. The same speed he went up in the tree, the same speed he came down with. You know, we hear about Felix, the governor of, of, of um, I forgot where he was the governor of, but Paul preached to him. Paul was preaching to him, and he said, I want a more convenient time. He said, I want a more convenient time. This is not a good time for me to learn about Jesus. And so many of us might be saying that. This is not convenient. I'm young. I want to experience life. Who tell you you're going to get a chance to experience life? And we could tell you what experience in life could bring. Heartache, sickness, poverty. He says, now is the day of salvation. I'm calling on all of us to make a commitment to serve God with all of our hearts. Right here and right now. To stop. I know I said this to myself. I want to stop. Wasting time. I got less years in front of me than I have behind me. And I want all of us to give God the best of our life. For the rest of our life. There's nothing. Whatever you want in life, God will give it to us. If we give him what he's asking of us. Which is just to give him our best. And it says that Zacchaeus. Every other, elsewhere in the Bible, they tell us 
that people said, I'm trying a dinner for Jesus. And Jesus was there. Oh, he was at Peter's house. This is the only time in the entire Bible that Jesus invited himself to somebody's house. He said, today, this man who everybody despised and thought he was a murderer and a thief, Jesus said, I'm coming to your house. The son of glory is still saying the same thing. I'm coming. I want to be with you. I want to dine with you. This is what it's about, you know. And the scripture said that he came down gladly. I want to say that I can only imagine he was saying he has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has not despised my offering. He didn't take God doesn't listen to what the popular people have to say about us. He doesn't ask the opinion. God only cares about our heart. Man look on the outward, but God looks on our heart. And if we give God the best of our lives, I'm calling on all of us to come out. And I'm telling you it's not easy. I'm telling you that it takes effort. I wake up every morning and I spend time praying, reading, worshiping. You know why? I have a bad temper. And the day I don't do it, I tend to get in trouble on the job. Because I can tell somebody something they're going to upset me. It's only if I stay tuned into Jesus. That's what makes the difference in our lives. Nothing else matters. And all of the people, the whole crowd, this was a massive crowd, say, where he going? He don't know how wicked that man is. Why he's going to his house? They got a lot better people whose house he could go to. I don't know who house he could have gone to that they wouldn't have been a sinner. Because Paul tells us, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. None of us are better than anybody. It doesn't matter. I have to, I say two things. I'm not better than anybody and nobody better than me. Because we are all nothing in the sight of God. All of our righteousness is as filthy rags. And the money don't make you better. Because all of us go in six feet under and no money, nothing that we have can we take with us. I promise us that. Only what's done for Christ will last. We're looking for a legacy. That our children will worship. That they will come to know God. That we'll have a long and broken line of, of, of grandchildren and great-grandchildren who give their lives to God. But Zacchaeus had been changed. When you have an encounter with God, you get changed. You don't talk the same. You don't walk the same. You don't look the same. And you know what Zacchaeus said? I'm going to give half of everything I have to the poor. He didn't say, I'm going to give it to the crowd here who might not need it. We have to be careful when we're giving, that we give to people who are truly in need, not people who are in greed. We're not going to get blessed for, oh, we're raising money to buy a Mercedes Benz for the pastor. When people in the church can't pay their bills and having trouble feeding their children. That is nonsense. Let the pastor look after himself in Jesus' name. The call is to give to the poor. Scripture tells us that Jesus says the only thing that's going to get us into heaven, if we feed the hungry, clothe the naked, welcome the stranger, minister to the sick, and visit those that are in prison, and we must do it to the least. To the ones who have it the worst. To the ones who really need it. Because Jesus said when you do that, you do it, you minister unto him. And this is the call. The call when you stand in front of Jesus on the day of judgment isn't, were you in church a lot? 
Did you put a lot of money in the offering? Did you sing? Did you preach? Were people blessed when you preach or when you sang? None of that matters. The Bible says judgment morning. This will be the question. On the left, those of you who couldn't be bothered to help anybody except your four no more. And on the right, those who gave to others. And I'm a living witness that if you really help people who are in need, God is going to provide for you in miraculous ways that you can't even understand. And Zacchaeus said, anybody who I stole from, I'm not just going to give them back what I stole. I'm going to give them back four times as much. So they can't say that, oh, there's interest on it and you still rob me. Nobody gets 400% interest on anything. But that's what Zacchaeus was giving back. And he was also giving away half of everything to the poor. There's all, the Bible says the poor will always be with us. There's always somebody you could help. There's always somebody in need. A lot of the money we're spending on counseling, etc. If we would get up and help people, healing would come. Stop thinking just about ourselves. I can tell you that since God brought me out and moved me in to Clarksville and I started getting involved and being active with a lot of people, that I'm doing much better. I used to be very depressed. I used to be really down. But God has smiled on me. He has set me free. I'm doing so much better because I'm able to speak about God's word. And the, the scripture says that it says, this man is a son of Abraham. And Paul explains to us that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. And we are Abraham's children because we believe God. And so we've been made righteous in the sight of God. And the scripture, the last scripture, they say, some theologians said this is the sweetest verse in the entire Bible. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He didn't come to sit down with the... He didn't say, I'm going to be important. I'm going to sit with the wonderful ones. I'm going to go up to Herod's palace. He came to seek and save the lost. Anybody who don't know who Jesus is, is lost. And we are supposed to be helping them know about Jesus. I know we won't, I know, I know that we won't reach everyone now. But the Bible says, train up a child in the way that he should run when he's old. He will not depart. You may not get it now, but I pray that you will get it. That you remember this. When... When times come, a hard time's going to come. Life is like that. That you remember the name of Jesus. And that he wants to save us. He wants to keep us. He's looking after us. And I pray that all of us will make it our business to go out and tell others about Jesus. Jesus wasn't looking for important people to demonstrate how powerful he was. He was here in a crowd walking. You think he couldn't have called an angel and said, I don't want to walk, take me to Jerusalem. And they would have had to obey him because he was their Lord and master. But he was the son of man. And so he came to be, to demonstrate to us that we could live as Christians no matter what. I'm going to pray. We're running late. We started late and I'm sorry for that. But I do want us to remember that God is going. God is going to reward those who diligently seek him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father and our God, I thank you for the opportunity to lift up your name. I thank you for your presence here. I thank you for everyone here. Right now in the name of Jesus, we call forth a blessing on everyone here. Take us through this week. Uh, show us favor, God. We cancel all the plans of the enemy in the name of Jesus.
We cancel generational curses in the name of Jesus. We declare favor on everyone here in the name of Jesus. That we're going to walk in victory. And that God is going to open doors, make ways where they seem to be no way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's do the, the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Have a blessed week.